So today we're diving into how the U.S. has quietly become the world's biggest investor in spyware, which is this black market multi-billion dollar industry that has become really scary. I mean, we're talking ICE contracts with Israeli firms, former prime ministers hacking into people's phones, and even Trump reclassifying NASA as a spy agency. Yeah, last year alone, there were 20 new US-based spyware investors, which brings the total number of American backers of spyware to 31. And to put that in context, the EU in total has 31 and Israel has 26. So we are by far the leaders. And in case you don't know exactly what spyware is, it is any malicious software that secretly gathers personal information or anything about your activity from a device like a computer or a phone without your consent and sometimes without even your knowledge. So it obviously poses grave threats to human rights and national security. And the U.S. government is actually using some of this like really shady spyware. So we'll start with breaking down an example that you've probably seen in the headlines, which is ICE's new contract with Israeli made spyware called Graphite that can basically hack into any phone and steal all of your data. Oh, just all your data. (laughs) (laughs) And the fact that the government is using this actually has like kind of an interesting backstory because the Department of Homeland Security first entered this contract actually under the Biden administration, but it was put on hold for this like compliance review just because there are so many guardrails under Biden about spyware use. But now that Trump is president, that pause has been lifted. And so ICE has finally, just a couple weeks ago, entered this $2 million contract. And we don't know exactly how ICE is planning to use it, but they have the capability to track people's locations, read their messages, obviously look at their pictures, read information, even in encrypted apps, which is really scary. And they can even use it as a listening device. So if you're just talking around your phone, they could be listening in. So obviously it has been a very controversial software. Like Italy is very right-wing government as we know, actually had to cancel its own contracts because there was all of these reports of graphite being used to target hundreds of journalists, pro-immigrant advocates, and even associates of Pope Francis, like super random. (laughs) And it's just funny because Paragon, which is like the parent company of graphite, has tried to set itself apart from other spyware competitors by saying that it only targets like crime and terrorists, which obviously is not true, like it's targeting civilians. And interestingly, it also says it only does business with democracies, which is different from the next spyware company that we're going to be talking about, which is a lot more sinister and powerful, and it's called NSO. And so NSO is another Israeli-based cyber intelligence firm that is known for its proprietary spyware software called Pegasus that has like a technical advantage. It's capable of remote zero-click surveillance of smartphones. Zero click is so scary because like when we were at CBS, for example, we would do trainings about phishing emails. And if you get an email that looks shady, don't click the link. Or if it's like from an unknown sender, don't click the link because clicking the link will take you to, and then it'll take all your information. But this, there would be even no link to click. So how do you even protect yourself against it? No, yeah, like it doesn't require any interaction from the phone's user to actually infect your phone, which is so scary. Like you can have a WhatsApp call basically come up on your phone and then bam, Pegasus infects your phone and can basically be used as a 24 seven surveillance device. So it can do the usual, like look at your photos and text, but also harvest your photos and record your calls. And this is crazy. It can secretly film you through your phone's camera, activate the microphone to record your conversations, pinpoint where you are, where you've been, who you've met. And the reputation of NSO is really muddied because it's been implicated in a lot of criminal activity. Like the program was actually related to the killing of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi. And so because of all of this, it was actually on the Biden administration's blacklist, meaning that it can't work with U.S. companies without U.S. government approval because of the fact that it's worked with all of these dangerous regimes. So because of all of this, the company was pretty desperate. It was in like financial free fall. They weren't really getting these huge government contracts until Hamas attacked Israel two years ago on October 7th because the use of spyware in these kinds of conflict situations became easier to market. Mm. And so at this point, it became pretty obvious to NSO that it would be better for business if Trump won. So the NSO conducted a multi-million dollar lobbying campaign, basically targeting pro-Israel Republicans. And then Trump won. So you're probably thinking, where are all the lawsuits against this company if they're doing all of this shady stuff? Well, we will tell you about them. So earlier this year, NSO was ordered to pay Meta $170 million for hacking 1,400 WhatsApp accounts with its Pegasus software, which is that no, that zero-click software. And it was found liable for video calling activists and journalists and using that call to send malware into their phone. Crazy. And they're also now being sued by a group of Salvadoran journalists in U.S. court. 
after they were attacked with the Pegasus software. And you might be like, well, how can they sue in U.S. court if they live in El Salvador? And originally, a district court judge threw it out because it's like this is an entirely foreign case. But it was found later that the court failed to take into consideration that these these attacks work by creating Apple IDs, Mm. which means it has to go through Apple's computer servers in California. And actually, Google and Microsoft wrote letters of support on behalf of the Salvadoran journalists saying, even if this isn't happening on U.S. soil, it's obviously in the U.S. interest to try to crack down on this. So appeals court ruled it can move forward. And despite all of this, Trump is expected to eventually probably take the NSO off of this Biden blacklist so that it can do business with American companies. And I just thought it was weird because Republicans and Trump always talk about how important national security is, but the U.S. is using the spyware program that's being built in other countries. So isn't that a counterintelligence threat? Like, why are they not worried about the fact that they could spy on everyone and then sell that information to other governments? It's so weird. Yeah, no, you would definitely think, but Trump has been doing some surprising things in the spy world because you probably missed that last month he issued an executive order declaring NASA is now a spy agency. Literally how? (laughs) Quote, it now has as a primary function intelligence, counterintelligence, investigative, and national security work. And this reclassification doesn't even mention science or exploration, which is obviously NASA's usual focus. And Transportation Secretary Sean Duffy, who is also the acting NASA administrator. Did you know that? No, (laughs) I didn't know that. But he vowed last month that NASA will give up, quote, all of these Earth sciences, obviously just dismissing climate change and all of the important work NASA does. I wonder if they're also okay with doing that because they're entering all these like private space contracts. I wonder if that's just another step to kind of make NASA irrelevant and envelop their technology to help their agenda. Yeah, and they probably want to give business to their like wealthy friends. But this reclassification as a spy agency raises concerns about the information that NASA produces and their scientists like produce because it could get a national security stamp on it, meaning it's classified, meaning the public won't have access to it anymore, which has been a really important part of NASA's research in the past. And this all seems to follow Trump's desire to militarize space. Like we've reported on his Golden Dome missile defense program which is basically a combination of israel's iron dome but in space and it's kind of like reagan's star wars and it'd be capable of intercepting missiles even if they're launched from space or the other side of the world which obviously that would be insane but it would cost as much as half a trillion dollars to build like 500 billion it's like hard to even conceptualize and lockheed martin is one of the major contractors on it so militarizing space actually violates the peaceful principle of the outer space treaty remember when we spoke to the space lawyer so all of this would actually be illegal anyway and this is obviously such like a broad conversation so to get a better understanding of surveillance technology we kept referring back to ronan farrow and his reporting on surveillance tech and you probably all remember him he's woody allen's son he's a famous journalist who's one Allegedly. (laughs) And he's a famous journalist that won a Pulitzer for his reporting on Harvey Weinstein. And he, a few years ago, came out with this book called Catch and Kill, where he talks about how this spyware company called Black Cube was used by Harvey Weinstein to target him, follow him around, basically use former Israeli military to stalk his sources. And the book is like crazy. It just talks about how because spyware is so unregulated, it's not just used by governments. It can be used by whoever's paying them enough and can interfere with like reporting and journalism. And you know what's crazy? Like Black Cube isn't just hired for random personal vendettas. We found out that an Israeli minister held talks with Black Cube just last year to spy on students participating in pro-Palestinian protests in the U.S. Whoa. I know. That's like so crazy. But actually, they ended up not going through with it because they didn't want to damage like U.S.-Israel relations. But it just goes to show how many spy agencies like this exist and how they're proliferating in the world. Well, to give you a very high profile example of that, U.S. authorities are investigating a bogus malware email that clearly came from Chinese hackers aimed at giving China insights into the Trump administration's trade talks with China. So to set the scene, just imagine you work in D.C. and you get an email that appears to be sent from Republican Representative John Mulinar, and he's attached a potential piece of legislation and he's asking you to review it, quote, like your insights are essential. And this email was sent to U.S. trade groups and law firms and government agencies, 
and it looks like it's from him. You're obviously going to click on it. But once you open the drafted legislation, it would have allowed hackers extensive access to not only your computer system, but the whole computer network that you're attached to. Whoa. And so they were able to trace this back to APT41, which is a Chinese hacking group. But the scariest thing is, as of now, they can't determine if any of the emails succeeded in getting information. They don't even know what these hackers got. And actually, this conversation is very timely because last week, Washington has been mulling over spyware liability and who is liable if someone's phone is compromised. So the political think tank you referenced, Atlantic Council, has proposed legislation that would shield tech companies from lawsuits when their products are exploited by spyware. So for example, if we're using an Apple phone and someone hacks in and gets our information, right now we could sue Apple. Why didn't they protect us? But this is this legislation would allow companies to qualify for safe harbor protection, but only if they do a few things, like they have to be very serious about threat notification and detection programs, like show a clear investment in that. They have to share information about spyware targeting. So if they find out that their systems are compromised, they have to be transparent about that. And they have to quickly patch any vulnerabilities with enhanced security features when it happens. Well, this is all just so interesting for us to even research on and like talk about because as technology gets more advanced, as AI gets more advanced, this spyware and the muddiness in which it operates, it's just going to become like a bigger and bigger deal. 